us. Joshua 1 and 9 says, Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. 2 Chronicles 20, 15 says, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by the reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Deuteronomy 3.22 says, Ye shall not fear them, for the Lord your God shall fight for you. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say then to these? If God be for us, who can be against us? Ephesians chapter 6 says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Seven says, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No more chains holding me. From now on, I am free. I'm gonna shout it out loud. No more chains holding me. the campers said amen come on all of the campers said amen come on before you're seated high five your neighbor and say we've had a good time you may be seated 
In Jesus' name. Just a few announcements here. There may be, I don't know, maybe just a few t-shirts left. So I encourage you, if they're back there and we have a couple left, make sure to pick that up for $10. How many love that camp DVD that we watched last night, campers? Wasn't that awesome? Well, here's the cool thing. You can take that home with you. They're only $10. You can get them at the media booth, uh, the DVD that we watched last night. And then also, how many has just thoroughly enjoyed this amazing preaching this week? Come on, make it just a little bit of noise for how awesome this preaching has been. Amen. Amen. You can also pick up those DVDs at the media booth for only $10. You can get the audio CD for $5. And so I think it would be pretty awesome if we uh, took some of those home for maybe our friends or loved ones that couldn't be here tonight or this week and, and be able to share that with them. Also tonight, we are encouraging all of our parents and students to do your very best to be off the campgrounds at 11 p.m. Turn to your neighbor, say 11 p.m. And so thank you, thank you, thank you in advance for all of your help uh, in, in being off the grounds at 11 p.m. Our district youth president is coming to give some awards and to uh, make some uh, 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 announcements here. But before he does, I think it would be an awesome thing if we would just let our youth president, which I believe is the greatest in the nation, I think it would be awesome if we stood and we gave some appreciation to our youth president and first lady, brother and sister Barbara. Come on, would you give it up? you guys. Y'all are the best, the best, best, best. And uh, I feel like I'm on repeat, but I got to do this again. I said this to the senior campers last week, but I think this is some of the greatest scripture that we see on leadership found in Daniel chapter six, where it talks about how King Darius promoted Daniel, an outsider. He, he, he didn't grow up under King Darius. He, he wasn't one of them. He didn't talk like them. He didn't look like them. Daniel was an outsider. But King Darius promoted Daniel to be over the entire kingdom. And the reason being, the scripture says, is because he had an excellent spirit. And it, it, it moves me because when I read this text, I cannot help but think of amazing leaders like Brother and Sister Barber that when they lead and when they help and when they serve and when they go above and beyond, they do so with an excellent spirit. And so one more time, we love you. We thank you. Would you one more time give it up for Brother and Sister Barber? Hey, man, thank you so much for those kind words, and I wish that we deserved half of them and your applause. We are so humbled and just excited to get to be out here at camp and pretend that we're still young. Of course, when you see me out playing basketball, you know that's not true, uh, but I appreciate you allowing me to act like that, and we just love camp so much, and I remember coming in as a new convert at 18 years old and being so impacted by the Indiana campgrounds, and to be able to serve in this capacity is just something that we don't take lightly, and I know I'll get to make some remarks in a moment, but I love this committee, love the Petersons, like family. They're some of the best people you will ever get to be around. And I mean that with all my heart. That being said, we will have some moments tonight for some thank yous. And I know you'll just permit me just a few brief moments to take pause in this service to give thanks to every person who made camp meeting possible this summer for our team camps. And I want to start just by thanking these wonderful campers. And I've been around youth camps for some years now and have seen some junior camps come and go. And from Monday night on, this has been an exceptional junior high camp. And I give credit and honor to these hungry students that just love the truth, love the word, 
and made that very evident from the first night. I don't recall a junior camp meeting where they just came ready to have some church, and we've just had great church day sessions, night sessions. And I give them honor because I know that Jesus promised he wouldn't send another flood, but I began to wonder a couple times this week if, uh, if he was going to, I don't know what was going on out there. But our campers cooperated and just enjoyed, I think, their time in the mud. It was uh, an interesting week, and we give them credit for just jumping in and having a good time. And we just love these wonderful students. And I'm just so impressed. And I know many people say it, and maybe I'm taking too long tonight. I know many people say this, that the best is yet to come. But after the couple weeks we've had, I don't know that I have believed it any more than I do right now, that these students are going to take us into the greatest end-time revival our world and our nation has ever seen. Amen. Too many people to list individually, and so we'll do it by category in some cases. But, man, so many people lend their hands in help for camp meeting both the week of and weeks leading up to it. Brother and Sister Oliver and Westside Apostolic for this wonderful concession food this week. So good I didn't get mad gaining seven, eight, nine pounds at least. Uh, So good. And Sister Troxel and the kitchen staff. Uh, Sister Perry and the ice cream stand staff, Brother and Sister uh, Young back there, Brother Ball and the maintenance staff, Brother Odell, Brother Parker, Sister Gwaltney for speaker's meals, our nurses this week, Sister Cox, Sister Waltz, Sister Troxel, we love them, and they've had a busy past couple of days, uh, thankful for keeping us safe and healthy. Our sound team, Brother D. Giovanni and his wonderful team, I know there's been countless guys back there, Brother Caleb and many others, we love you and thank you for your work. Our media team, Sister Caldwell, Noah Shaw, uh, Brother Gabe, so many people back there, Sister Voris, we thank you guys for all your help and work. Our rec director this week is no stranger to junior high camp. We love them, and they did a fantastic job, especially juggling this wonderful Hoosier weather that we have that wasn't really cooperating. Brother and Sister Campfield are some of the best people in the world. I love them so dearly, and they're awesome team. Thank you guys so much. Our camp video this week was Chris Henderson. Brianna Campfield has worn many hats this week. She helped us with photography and video and did a great job. And Sister Daisy Mooney. And then our camp assistant, Brother Grant Lingallion. At this time, we're going to welcome Brother Campfield is going to come and help us with some awards for our top athletes. Would you welcome him as he comes to present these awards? Praise the Lord, everyone. I want to start off and say what an honor it was to serve this week with the Indiana Youth Committee and all of you awesome students of the Indiana District. It's been awesome to be out here. Uh, I'd like to thank all my staff and supervisors before we get too carried away, Uh, all the dorm supervisors and anybody else who helped us this week. As he said, the weather was crazy, Uh, took a lot of hands to make it happen, and I'm very appreciative of all the work that we put into it. Uh, Although the always changing weather and wet grounds had me stressing out what to do almost daily, you guys, the campers, made it happen every single day. Uh, You guys refused to let the rain, a little bit of rain, stop you from having a great time. You also refused to let a lot of rain stop you from having a great time. We played in the rain, slid through the mud, and tromped through the puddles. And for some reason, some even floated in left field on a giant inflatable rubber duck like they were in a tropical oasis. I don't know. (laughs) For all the parents, I apologize for anybody who has to run those clothes through their washing machine. So, uh, although I love all the fun that I get to have with these kids each year, the least favorite part of my job is that I have to choose a top athlete. I contemplated today if there was somehow that maybe I could smash the trophy into a bunch of little pieces and break it up and just give everybody a little piece. But I really like being here every year, and I figured that wouldn't get me invited back. So I talked with my team, and we were able to find one young man and young woman that exemplified what I look for in a Christian athlete. We wanted someone who loves sports, loves their competitors, and most of all, loves Jesus. Without me rambling any further, I'd like to announce our top female athlete. Can we do a drum roll? Are we too tired to do a drum roll? Can we do it? Thank you. Michaela King.
I have to say, you know, I always have to find like one defining moment that is the, that I know that that's my person. And we were playing softball yesterday. She had her mud boots on. She was sliding through the dirt. She was a filthy mess. Once again, I apologize to whoever has to wash those clothes. But she was phenomenal this week. And now for our boys. This one, I talked to all my staff. Let's do a drum roll. Let's do a drum roll. Come on. All right. Jack Story. I think that was the first time this year when I talked to my staff, it was unanimous. He was the first name out of all their mouths. Phenomenal job. And he really proved himself today because we were playing softball. He caught the ball when I hit it and got me out. And I figure any young man on selection day that will get the rec director out is the real deal. So once again, give him a round of applause. Once again, thank you campers. I love all of you guys and I'm excited to see you soon and see how you're turning your world upside down. Amen. We are blessed in the Indiana district with just the best of the best leadership. We give them honor, our district board, our district superintendent, Brother Straub, district secretary, uh, all the presbyters, all the pastors, all the parents. It's so great to come out to junior camp and every service has been filled in the back with just support systems and prayer warriors, grandmas, grandpas, so many others. And we give honor to our great leadership. I will pause here to just briefly say that I love the Indiana Youth Committee and every person who's been elected to this wonderful team just makes our life easier. We feel such a deep family tie and connection to you all. What a great week we've had. I honor you. I love you. I'm going to stop before I cry, but you all are the best, and I thank you for just an awesome camp season. Would you put your hands together for this wonderful youth committee? Amen. That's right. Amen. Our presbyter on grounds this week was Brother Williams, and we're thankful for his help. Our registration coordinator, Sister Amanda Robinson, has just streamlined the registration process, and we're thankful for her. Camp controller, Brother Terry Long. Our executive staff, Brother and Sister Dooley. Security, Brother and Sister Smith, which was a busy job this week, by the way. Uh, our camp dean, Brother and Sister Gilliland. Camp principal, Brother and Sister Sizemore, our newest members to the committee, did a fantastic job. Our youth secretary, I love them so much. I love Brother and Sister Peterson. I can't say it enough and can't say it deeply enough. Just if you'll allow me a very selfish pause here, I just want to thank my wife and my two wonderful kids for just sticking it out this summer. We love you so much, and they're the best. And the real MVPs of any camp season is, everybody knows this, the dorm counselors. Could you just put your hands together and thank all of our counselors for their sacrifice, taking time off work, pausing their summer to come out here and labor among you. They love you, and we love them. Amen. Brother Sizemore is going to come at this time and present our top usher awards. Would you welcome him? It's been an incredible week this week with you junior campers. I love all of you. We've had some so much fun together. Uh, I've been very encouraged and inspired by these junior campers. There's a response to the word of God. Their worship has been inspiring and encouraging. And I've had the privilege of leading the best of the best, if you ask me. I'm just being biased. But the Usher squad this week, we have formed a great unity this week. We have formed great friendships this week, and I've been very encouraged to see the next generation serving God with gladness. They do not act like it's a, some sort of duty or responsibility for them to clean the church and Windex the back doors and pick up gum off the pews. They 
do it as a privilege. They feel like it's an opportunity to serve God. And I love these wonderful ushers. And if you are an usher this week, will you come up here and will you stand and will you guys give them a hand clap right now? Woo! Awesome. Incredible men and young, young men and young ladies here and, and pastors, parents, student pastors, if your kid is up here right now, I promise you, you have a great kid. And you should be very, very, very proud of these young men and these young ladies that are up here right now. And without further ado, I'm going to announce our top usher. Our top male usher was none other than Logan Peterson, buddy. Come on up here. Woo! Congratulations, buddy. Here. Awesome young man of God, doing everything with a smile. He was incredible. And our top female usher was Tosh Mosier. Come on up, Natasha. Incredible. Incredible woman of God. Thank you, ushers. Thank you for everything you've done. And uh, you guys want to give him the sign one, two, one time? You guys want to give him our sign? All right, ready? One, two, three, ushers. All right. Amen. You guys can be seated. These awesome people. Oh, sure. Amen. And our final award is the President's Award. And this award is reserved to an exceptional young person. And of course, when we go through the list this week, it's just a grueling process of trying to narrow it down to one person, especially on weeks like this. It was a long, long discussion. And this award is reserved for somebody who didn't just so show exceptional qualities while at camp, but we also look to research to see that these qualities are displayed leading up to camp meeting and following camp meeting. And so somebody who's just a good steward of the faith, both on the campgrounds as well as in their local assembly and in the work that they do for the kingdom of God. This young person is in media ministry at their church. He plays aux keys and is part of the choir for the music department. Great singer, great Bible quizzer. He spent three years in junior Bible quizzing, and this was his first year as a senior Bible quizzer. He's a co-leader of a Project 7 Bible club. He's a good young preacher. He was a real McCoy in 2018. From the Sanctuary Church in Newcastle under the leadership of Pastor Jacob, would you put your hands together for Perry Bell. seated. Last just couple remarks here and then we're going to transition into the next session of the service. I want to do this now so that their preacher, our evening evangelist, can take it straight from the worship team. We've had powerful and dynamic worship. I want to press just on just a little bit longer and give thanks to our ministry workers, both in worship and the word this week. Brother and Sister Lytle has led us into the worship, into the presence of the Lord day and night. So good. They've done an incredible job, not just in leading in worship, but cultivating their team. And I think one of the coolest things I've seen at camp meeting was not just to see the praise band and praise singers up here, but to see campers coming up every single night and giving their talents to the Lord. And didn't just do it in a talented way, but you could feel the anointing in this young generation. Just an incredible job. And we thank them for not just, not just leading in worship, but investing so deeply into the next generation of worship leaders. Our daytime speaker this week has been one of my dearest friends. I love Pastor L.J. Harry. Amen. 
Amen. He has poured his heart out to us every single day and has given his giftings to communicating to your generation and we love him. His transparency and love of scripture has been so powerful and made such an impact on the lives of our students in various ways. We give honor to him. And then finally, our evening evangelist, just one of the men I've looked up to for many years. I love Pastor Chantry Dean. We've flat out had some church in this place every night. Many received the Holy Ghost. So I appreciate his passion for the word, encouraging us, challenging us, allowing God to speak through him to shape us. He pastors a church having explosive revival. I've just enjoyed getting to sit with him and hear what God is doing in their lives. We're so glad that his wife was able to attend and Brother Harry's daughter and their daughter, Ava and McKenna, were with us this week. We're so glad that they were able to come. I briefly mentioned to this, them this sentiment yesterday that watching them from afar and serving on the General Youth Committee with them, you could tell there was something special about both Pastor LJ and Pastor Chantry, and we love them. It's so evident that they have a deep honor to have uh, things of the kingdom established in their lives. Their humility is very evident, and the reason that God was so mightily magnified in our services was because these men and their families have decreased so that God could be increased in this place, and we love them and we give them honor for this. We love these precious people. Would you put your hands together one more time for them and all those who made camp possible as we welcome Brother Gilliland. Could all of our ushers come and get in place here tonight? You know, we have taken up offerings all throughout this week and our students have taken out of their ice cream money and their shakes, shake money and money that they brought for concessions following service and we're thankful for their giving hearts but here you come tonight and maybe you just have a few dollars in your wallet maybe a $20 bill, $50 bill amen, whatever it may be that you could give tonight amen, I just want you to know that it is being invested into the lives of young people that are here, that their lives are changed because of church camp. And I want to thank you for your sacrifice tonight and for giving tonight this offering. I believe that it is a worship. Amen. Let's just pray over this here tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give here tonight. Lord, I pray that you would just bless this offering. Lord, that it would go and that it would, uh, Lord, multiply, God, in its use, God, that it would uh, just be, uh, Lord, go forth into this, uh, uh, Lord, this future, God, of these uh, young people throughout the state of Indiana. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Amen. I'll ask you to stand with me all across this place. We're going to go to the Lord in a season of prayer for this final junior high evening service. I know you're tired. I know you're weary, but I don't know about you, but I've come to magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Come on, junior campers. You ought to shout amen right now. As the worship team comes, I'll share a story that I pass on with permission of the man who went through this and one of my friends went to camp meeting as a young man and he went, came from a troubled background, a troubled home. And he would go home from camp meeting and he would take his two camp suits and he locked them up in a camp bag and he'd zip that, that bag tight and he'd hang it in his closet. And he'd go home to situations that were unbecoming and difficult to live through. And whenever time got difficult at home from abusive situations, he would un unzip that suit bag just enough to fit his head inside. And he'd just begin to smell his suits, which sounds funny, but he just wanted to smell the smell of camp meeting. And it was all that, all that little bit of scent was all that he would require to encourage himself and say, you know what, God has done some things in my life. Come on, we all put our hands together for the Lord. But here's the point I'd like to make was he didn't take that moment and relish that second so that he could just begin to think about, I can't wait to get back to camp meeting. And of course he did. Those moments were purposeful and intentional because it gave him enough encouragement so that he could say, you know what? I'm not looking for another camp meeting. I'm looking for tomorrow to come around and I'm going to make a difference right now. There needs to be a junior high camper that just begins to exalt God in this place right now for the victories that have been made, the territory that has been won, the progress that has been had. But you need to purpose it in your mind right now and build an Altar, not just of repentance but of consecration and say I'm not going to go back to the place where God has brought me from that come Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday I'm going to continue to magnify the King of Kings come on camp meeting is not your salvation it might have been an impetus of a breakthrough but you're going to have a breakthrough on Monday and on Tuesday come on one more time I'll ask you to lift your hands and lift your voice to him as we begin to ask his presence to manifest itself in this place Lord, we love you, Jesus. We're so thankful for what you've done this week, all the mighty works that you've done. For every young person filled with the Holy Ghost, for every young person who's been delivered of bondage, for every young person who's had the penalty of sin repealed from their life, we give you glory right now. And we come into this house one more time to feel your presence because we're going to go back home to our local assemblies and make a difference in the world around us. If you believe it, would you just put your hands together? How many is thankful for everything he's done in your life this week? And how many is ready to take what he's done and what he's brought you through and take it back home? Hallelujah, Jesus. We glorify you.
are thankful for the faithfulness of God. And in the dark days, we are never alone. God is with us. He's before us, behind us, beside us. I'm thankful for that. I have this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God. The seal inside the storm. The promise of the shore. I trust the power of your word. Enough to seek your kingdom first. Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves. When I walk through the waters, I won't be over. There's nothing our God can't do. 
out of you, Jesus. There's not a mountain to talk. There's not a problem too small that Jesus can't be solved. In time you get involved, our God, He cares about us. So wait on the Lord. Come on. Wait. How many believe that? There's not a night too dark. A journey too long to embark. Jesus will bring you through. In time, he'll make you new. My God, he cares about us. Sing, wait on the Lord.
together for the Lord, our great God, our King, our Redeemer. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Praise God. You can make your way back to your seat. We're going to have plenty of opportunity at the conclusion to continue in our prayer and worship tonight. It is truly been such an honor for my family and I to be in this great district with all of you. If you'll remain standing just for a moment. I know it's been said, but I can't not say again what an honor it has been to be with this great district and your wonderful leadership. Give honor to Brother Barber, Brother Peterson, and this entire youth team who has put on just a first class camp but an anointed and powerful camp and I am so thankful for their friendship and for their kindness to me this week and to my family you've truly made us feel welcome and at home thank you so much for your kindness and your kind words and all the kind gestures throughout this week and I appreciate their friendship so very much and the opportunity to have been able to have gotten closer to them in, in our friendship and to your great leadership in this district, Brother Stroud, Brother Johnson, and the Presbytery, I give you honor and thank you for allowing me to be here. And um, to, to our, as already been said, to our day speaker, but my dear friend, you will not find a more genuine, a more genuine, fun, <laughs> crazy fun and passionate about the Word of God guy than Brother L.J., Pastor L.J. Harry, whom I love so very much. I love him so very much and appreciate his friendship. He has no idea how much and what an example he is to all of us. We all need a little more Pastor L.J. in our lives. That's the truth. So I'm so thankful for his ministry. It's been spot on. So many friends that I have in this great district. Heather and I both were talking about it this week. So many people that have shown us uh, just uh, kindness throughout this week. And true friends. And we're appreciative of all that you've done. To this great camp. To all of you young men and young ladies who night in, night out, day in, day out. You have come. Although you've been tired, you have plugged in. And you have engaged in worship and in prayer. And God has definitely met us in this place this week. How many of you believe that? He's changed us, spoken to us, and I'm thankful for it. Thankful for it. Amen. I'm thankful for all that God has done. And it's not quite over yet. How many of you got a little bit more in the tank? You know God wants to speak something into our hearts tonight. Amen. Let me just say this before I get into my text. There was a band of brave souls that became known as one-way missionaries. They purchased single tickets to the mission field without the return half. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins. As they sailed out of port, they waved goodbye to everyone they loved and everything they knew. For they knew they would never return home. A.W. Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail for New Hybrides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that the headhunters who lived there had martyred or killed every missionary that had gone before him. 
Milne did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe and loved them. And when he died, tribe members buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed on his tombstone, When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. So I say to you tonight, hear me. We cannot cannot start believing that God wants to send us to safe places to do easy things. That faithfulness is holding the fort. That playing it safe is safe. That there is any greater privilege than the sacrifice that God has asked of us. That radical is anything but normal. Jesus did not die to keep us safe. But he died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't just radical. It should be normal. It's time to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. And it's time to go all in and all out for the all in all. So pack your coffin and let's sell out. And when we go back home, let's make a difference in the world around us. Let's be what we were created to be. Anybody in this place know that God's created you for more than normal? Amen. Amen, amen. So I thank God for your prayer. Thank God for your commitment that you have made to the work of God, the kingdom, and to his will. God is going to use you mightily, and I believe that with all my heart. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13 through 16, and then we'll read verse 20 through 23. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might and David was girded with a linen ephod so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet and as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David my call or Michael Saul's daughter however you want to say it I looked that up in Hebrew and it's like Michael, something like that so if you want to spit on your neighbor just try to say that Michael. Saul's daughter, she was, everybody say she was looking through a window at him. She saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him in her heart. She got angry at him. Verse 20, then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants. As one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in my own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. I want to preach to you with the help of the Lord tonight. So they say I'm crazy. So they say I'm crazy. Will you lift your hands one more time, Lord Jesus? I thank you. For all that you have done this week, I thank you, Lord, for the demonstration of your spirit. And I'm asking again tonight, Lord God, that you would pour out your spirit upon us. I pray, God, that you would move us. I pray that you would heal, that you would deliver, that you would feel again in this service tonight. And that you would challenge and encourage these students to go back home more on fire for you than they've ever been before and determined to live their life, oh God, at maximum impact. 
because they understand they are created for more than ordinary. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Has anybody in this house ever had an embarrassing moment? <laughs> if you haven't, you will. It's coming. My wife and I, we went on a little anniversary cruise. It's crazy how things happen to me when we go on trips. But we went on this anniversary cruise and we were in one of the dinner shows. And it was a huge, huge theater. And... Right in the, we were we were probably third third row in the very middle of this auditorium, and actually, you know, on our row it was really a long row, and on our row it was it was me and Heather in the middle, and then there was one other couple on the left side, one other couple on the far end, and right in the middle of that, all of a sudden it hits me, and I realize I cannot hold it. I've got to go to the restroom right now, and so. It was pretty dark in the building. They have little, the, the, the aisles, you know, lit up with the little lights. And so I was able to get out. But if you've ever gone outside of a dark room and it's real bright and then you come back into a dark room, how many of you know it's hard to see? Absolutely. And so I went to the restroom, came back in, and it was taking my eyes quite a while to adjust and was having a hard time figuring out where I was. And so I started down the aisle just following the little lights and, and I'm trying to find my seat and I'm trying to find the little bun, you know, on the top of the head. And, and I, I locate it and, oh, yeah, there it is. And, and so I start <clears throat> heading down the aisle and all is fine. Everything's going good and I'm ducking. There's several uh, people, hundreds of people behind me and I'm, I'm ducking down and, and I'm crossing over this couple that was sitting on our row and, and everything's good. They had just come back with fresh refills and their drinks. And, and um, as I was just about past this guy who, who, was, who was the last obstacle before I could be seated, I tripped over his foot. And when I tell you that their drinks went flying and I went flying, I tripped and fell all the way down the aisle. Into my seat, fell in my seat. And I tried to play it off like nothing had happened, you know. I pulled myself together and I look over and Heather's buns. <laughs> She's laughing hysterically. She always just laughs at me. There's no sympathy. She's laughing and I start laughing a little bit and I look over at the people and their drinks are everywhere and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, are you okay? <laughs> and they're like, yes, are you okay? It's pretty embarrassing. Or when I was preaching one time and I tripped and I fell all the way down the stairs of the platform, bounced up quickly like it was planned and started shouting, you know, that's what you got to do. Or like in the second grade, this is, oh, horrible. Heather's shaking her head. Please don't tell this story. It's too late. I've begun it. Second grade, when I raised my hand and I said, Miss, I'm not going to say her name because I'm still praying for her soul. But I said, can I please go to the restroom? I need to go to the restroom. And my stomach was hurting pretty bad. And she said, no, you need to stay. And I said, okay. And. About two minutes later, I said, can I please go to the restroom? She said, no. I said, okay. And the third time, I said, <laughs> out of the room. And as I ran out of the room, I left a trail behind me. All the way down the hallway. All the way into the restroom, it was too late. No need for the restroom. No need. Talk about embarrassing. Talk about embarrassing. That's embarrassing. 
That's embarrassing. I could speak for a long time about all my embarrassing moments because I have several. But I think deep down inside all of us are afraid of being embarrassed, really. We're afraid of being called crazy or looking crazy, looking silly. There's a poll out there that says the number one fear is speaking in public. The number two fear is death. That means that most people would rather die than speak in public. <laughs> Why is that? Because people are afraid of being embarrassed. And, and they're, they're afraid that somebody's going to think they're crazy. It's the curse of self-consciousness. The fear of not looking cool or classy is becoming a very big problem in the church. We have way too many young people losing sight of God because they can't see past themselves. This is a selfie generation. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's a selfie generation. Noah looked ridiculous building an ark in the desert. Sarah looked crazy buying maternity clothes at the age of 90. The Israelites looked crazy marching around Jericho. David looked crazy attacking Goliath with the slingshot. The wise men looked crazy following a yonder star. Peter looked nuts stepping out of the boat in the middle of the lake in the middle of the night. But that's faith. Faith is the willingness to look a little crazy. And the results speak for themselves, don't they? Because Noah and all of his family was saved from the flood. Sarah gave birth to Isaac. The walls of Jericho came tumbling down. David defeated a Goliath. The wise men found the Messiah. And Peter walked on water. Can I tell you why some of us have never killed a giant or walked on water? It's because we're not willing to take the risk of looking a little crazy. We're not willing to attack with a slingshot or get out of the boat in the middle of the lake. But I hope that I encourage somebody tonight to quit worrying about what somebody's going to think about you if you make up your mind that you're going to sell out to Jesus Christ. That somebody in this place before you leave this camp will have made up this, their mind that I don't mind if somebody else thinks I'm crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. I'm crazy for Jesus. I'm crazy about him. I love him and he loves me. Somebody shout amen. I think 2 Samuel 6 is a good example. It is one isolated incident, but I think it reveals why God uses David in such historic ways. David, he has just been crowned the king of Israel. He has defeated the Philistines. He has recaptured the fortress of Zion. And he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back home, back to Jerusalem. The Ark had been stored at Obed-Edom's house for some time. And now it is coming home. It is coming back to the place where it belonged. Everyone is celebrating, almost everyone. You can hear the whispers in town. The Ark is coming home. The whispers, they gain momentum as the ark gets closer. Finally, as the ark enters the gates of Jerusalem, the crowd begins to get louder in its chant. Celebration is on the horizon. Glory is about to fill the city because the ark is coming home. The ark represented the presence of God. And David is seen coming through the gates. And when he comes through those gates, David is dancing he is leaping. He is shouting. And at first, the people are a little shocked to see their king doing these things. But then the crowd, they begin to follow his example. And now David is dancing in the midst of this crowd. The ark is home. David was ecstatic about the movement of the ark. The crescendo is louder and louder. And almost everyone is watching with happiness. That is everyone but that one lady who is watching out of an upper room window. Michael is not happy at all. She is the daughter of Saul and she has an attitude problem. 
She thinks emotional display is reserved for the lower class citizens. She feels that dancing and leaping is beyond the means of royalty. David should calm down. He should cut out the display in front of his servants and his objects. But David is beside himself. The ark is home. He cannot control himself. He can't stop and furthermore, he does not want to stop. He's excited and it must be shown in his worship. For all of that is to say that this is one of the greatest days of his life. For in 2 Samuel 6, 16 it says, But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of of David, uh, Michael the daughter of Saul looked down from her window and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. Let me make an observation right here. When you get excited about God, don't expect everybody else to get excited about your excitement. Don't expect everyone. Some will. But not everybody. Don't expect everybody to. Here's why. Because when the Holy Ghost begins to stir within you, it disrupts the status quo or the norm. Some people will be inspired by what God is doing in your life, but others will be convicted. That means that they will feel bad for what they're not doing. And they will mask their personal conviction by finding something to criticize. Nine times out of ten, criticism is a defense mechanism. For when we criticize, we criticize in others what we don't like about ourselves. And so Michael is dripping with sarcasm. In 2 Samuel 6.20, it says that David went home to bless his family. And Michael says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. I don't know if she had a voice like that. but Disrobing in the sight of the slave girls. Here's what impresses me though about David. He wasn't afraid of looking crazy. He wasn't afraid of taking off his royal robes and dancing without hindrance and without inhibition before the Lord. Here's what impresses me. Here's what impresses me about David. He wasn't afraid of looking crazy. He was not afraid of of taking off the royal robes and dancing. Think about the circumstances. David was the newly crowned king of Israel. The significance of that is this. I think there was added pressure for him to act like a king. He had a reputation to protect. He had a crown to represent. Kings don't disrobe and dance. And that's right, they don't. But shepherd boys do. And he had learned to worship God as a shepherd boy watching his dad's sheep long before he ever became king. And once you get God inside of you, you can't, it's hard to get him out. Once you get a relationship with God, it's hard to not worship the king of glory. (laughs) And no one knew, no one knew this better than Michael about this kingship. You know why? Because she was a king's kid. She grew up in the palace. She knew the protocol. She knew the things to do and not do. And I'm guessing that Saul, her father, was very kingly. In fact... I think Saul woke up with scratches on his face because he slept with his crown on his head. Saul was all about the pomp and the circumstance and that's how she had been raised. But David wasn't raised that way. David got it. It was God first and then everything else. And he wasn't afraid of looking crazy when it came to his relationship with God. David said to Michael, woman, you got it all wrong. It wasn't for anybody but the Lord. It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone in his house when he had appointed me ruler over the Lord's people. So I will celebrate before the Lord and I will become even more undignified or crazy than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. The New Living Translation says, I am willing to act like a fool. In order to show my joy in the Lord. 
Yes, and I am willing to look even more foolish than this. Civilized. Let's pause right here and talk about this for a moment. When I read the gospel, I, I, the only civilized people I see are the Pharisees. Evidently, Jesus wasn't very impressed with civilized Pharisees. In fact, it seems to me that Jesus handpicked a dozen disciples who were very undomesticated. They were the misfits of the group. I see Jesus reprimanding the Pharisees and praising a prostitute who doesn't know any better than to crash a party and pour an alabaster jar of perfume on his feet as an act of worship. What God is looking for are people who are desperate enough to climb sycamore trees and cut holes in ceilings and push through crowds and yell at the top of their voices and jump out of boats to get to him. They don't mind what it looks like to anybody else. They just want to get to where he is. Undignified, they don't care. They don't mind who thinks they're crazy. Then David said, I will become even more undignified than this. One of the words for worship in Hebrew is halal. It means clamorously foolish. I love that. In other words, worship is crazy. It's a little foolish looking. And I guess in some ways, that is a a, a perfect uh, definition. Worship is a little crazy, isn't it? Singing to someone you can't see. Raising your hands to someone you can't touch. But let's just stop and think about this for a moment. Have you ever pulled up beside somebody at a stoplight? Your parents maybe pulled up beside them and you look over and you see them just getting down. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever seen anybody do it? Some of you have done it. Just getting with it. And they don't care. They're just getting it. But you know why they look crazy to the person in the other vehicle? It's because the person in the other car, they can't hear the music that they hear. They don't know what's happening inside that car. You know why people look at us and think that we're crazy? It's because they can't hear what we hear. They don't know yet that the blood of Jesus has been shed for our salvation. They don't know the song of redemption that you and I have been privileged to know yet. So they don't understand it yet. They don't know why there's a group of young people in Indiana that have been getting crazy for Jesus, worshiping and shouting and dancing. And They can't hear what you and I can hear. They haven't, they haven't yet heard the song of the redeemed. They don't know. But that's more reason why you need to just go ahead and do it. Because, because it doesn't matter. You know what God's done in your life this week. You know that God is good and greatly to be praised. You know that he has filled your life, picked you up. He has set your feet on a solid rock. Come on, is there a witness in this house tonight? Woo! Woo! You're going to go home. You hear me? You're going to go home to parents. Some of you, you're going to go home to to friends. You're going to go home to situations. And they're going to look at you. And you're going to walk in completely changed. Because you've been in camp this week. And God has changed you. God has spoken to you. God has, he has done things in your life. He's birthed ministries and desires and callings in each and every one of us. And you're going to walk home. And they're going to say, what in the world is wrong with you? You done lost your forever loving mind. You done gone crazy. That's what that's the kind of attitude we need to have. Not arrogant, but an attitude that says I don't matter. It don't matter to me what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter to me what it looks like to anybody else. I know what God has done for me. <laughs> is anybody ready to help me preach tonight? Come on, is anybody ready to close this last night out with a little bit of crazy praise under God? I 
wish I still had a, a voice. My goodness, makes me want to shout and holler and sing. That organ makes me want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if he's been good to you. I said if he set you free. If he's filled you with the spirit. If God has called you. If God has ministered to you. If God has spoken to you this week. You ought to be rejoicing. You ought to be worshiping. We're about to worship here in just a second. I mean, it's about to go crazy. Y'all about to y'all want to get crazy for Jesus here in just a minute? <clears throat> you see, that's what's happening in 2 Samuel 6. David hears the music. He knows by the Ark of the Covenant coming home, he knows what's happening. The presence of the Lord's coming back home. But Michael doesn't understand that. All I know is this. If we could tune in and hear what is going on in heaven and hear the angels singing, it would literally lift us off of our feet. We Hear me, wait. We would dance like David danced. If we could really see everything God has reached in and done for us. If we could see what God has reached in and done in our lives this week, this week, we would be going crazy right now. We wouldn't even need a praise team really to, to push us into. We, we, we would enjoy having them still, but before we even got to the first song, we'd be coming in here shouting and dancing and rejoicing and giving God praise. If we could see what God has done in us. If we could see all that He has kept us from, what He has healed us from, what He has delivered us from, we wouldn't care. We wouldn't care how good looking that girl or that guy is next to us. We would be going crazy for Jesus. I said we wouldn't be worried about what our hair looks like. We wouldn't be worried about what somebody's going to say about us. We would be going crazy for Jesus because we would understand he's done so much for me. He's done so much for me. Woo! My God. It says in 2 Samuel 6, 20, how the king of Israel, she said, has distinguished himself, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls like any indecent person might do. Yes, David took off his royal robes, but that's a perfect picture of worship. Worship is getting down to who we really are. It's saying this is who I really am. And I'm going to expose my heart to you, God. I'm going to give you all of me. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. This is real. God, here I am. Hallelujah. It's not about our royal robes. It's about what God has done for us. One of the greatest freedoms in the world is having nothing to prove. Instead of trying to prove who he was, the king of Israel, David was embracing who God was, which was the king of kings. Let me tell you what we need to... We, we, we need to when I was three years old and two years old, whatever, I ran around without any inhibitions. My mom has shown me some very embarrassing pictures later on in years as I ran around the house naked. And I bet you, y'all have some too somewhere. Let me tell you something. Do not do that today. You will get kicked off this campground and possibly arrested. 
But when we were two and three years old, we had no inhibition. We had no worries. You get a little child, they'll, they'll run, jump off of walls and do all kinds of crazy stuff. And parents are like, oh, oh. because kids, they don't, they don't care. They don't know. They don't know the danger. They don't know what's, what's going to happen if they fall off a 10-foot wall. They don't care. They don't care who's watching them when they're running around their diaper. <laughs> they don't care. I'm not saying we need to do that by any means. But we do need to get the attitude of a little child when it comes to worship. When it says it doesn't matter. It does not matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about me. It doesn't matter what they're going to say when I get back home. I know what I've experienced. I know the God that I serve. He's the king of glory. And he reached down and he touched my life. Oh, somebody clap your hands right now. Somebody begin to rejoice in the fact that he loves us, that he saved us, that he set us free, that he brought us out into his marvelous life. about that kids are not self-conscious remember what Jesus said you must become like little children if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven I think this is one dimension of that we need to become less self-conscious I think that's part of what John the Baptist meant when he said he must become greater I must become less we need to care more about what God thinks and care less about what people think I said we need to care more about what God thinks. Hallelujah. When I worship, I'm not worshiping for you, although I love you. I'm not worshiping for you. I'm not worshiping for you to see what I do. People can judge me if I want, but God's done too much for me. If the, listen, if the only thing, if the only thing that he ever did was die on a cross and shed his blood and give me an opportunity at grace and life eternal through his redemptive work of Calvary, then that would be enough if he never did another thing. That would deserve all of my praise and all of my worship and all of my adoration. We need to quit putting conditions on God. We need to quit saying, well, if he does this, I'll praise him. Well, if he does this, I'll praise him. No, you got it backwards. You need to go ahead and praise him, even if he doesn't, because he's still been good to us, because he still shed his blood for us. to the story David is intoxicated with God his dance is divine madness he takes off his royal robes and he loses all inhibition and he humiliates himself before God we are way too preoccupied with ourselves and that's what keeps us from worshiping God the way we could and the way we should let me tell you, the greatest moments are the moments when we lose self-consciousness. When we just lose ourselves in the presence of the Almighty God. Quit worrying about what somebody's going to do. Quit worrying about what's coming next. And just get lost in an experience with God. Get lost in the power of the Holy Ghost. Get lost. Get intoxicated on God. Oh, yeah. I've had a few people, I've had a few people 
since pastoring that would have a different opinion as they sit back and they watch everybody else and they criticize like Michael did that day. But I've got news for all those who say worship is supposed to be dignified and reserved. Let me tell you what heaven's going to be like. It's not going to be... No, 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 no. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, we're going to be worshiping around the throne. Brother Maroney, if it's going to be like that in heaven, why don't we go ahead and start it down here? If that's the way it's going to look in heaven, I might as well go ahead and get practice done. in praise and worship that when we came into our churches <laughs> the worship leader didn't have to go okay now everybody we're going to lift our hands together wouldn't it be awesome if when the pastor gets up to preach he didn't have to prompt us and prod us and pull us to worship and praise God wouldn't it be awesome if we just came into the house of God saying, I'm thankful that he found me. I'm thankful for his presence. I'm thankful. So I will dance. I will rejoice. I will be there. and then we're going to pray and we're going to rejoice and we're going to worship and then we're going to get out of here but God still wants to do some great things you, you with me? now hear me tonight the way you express your joy will create some misunderstanding people will misunderstand why you dance Michael misunderstood why he danced David did not dance for the young maids to see him but to celebrate the victory brought on by the hand of God Hear me, hear me, get ready. Some people don't like it when you love God more than you love them. I said some people don't like it when you love God more than you love them. But you need to say, don't matter. I'm crazy. I'm not ordinary. Hear me. If, if when you're in college, Brother Harry, thank you for saying that this week. You're in college and you're dating somebody, because you're all gonna wait till you get in college. 
But hear me, no, don't clap. Just listen. When that day comes, might as well go ahead and give you an advance here. Tell you in advance. When you get to that point in your life and you're dating that person, you're in a relationship with somebody, if they start getting jealous because your involvement in the church, you need to drop them like it's hot, honey. And you need to say, hey, if you can't love God more than you love me, then I can't love you. Come on. He's the greatest thing that ever happened to us. I love him. David said, Michael, you go ahead and sit up there and pout. You go ahead and sit up there and get jealous. But I'm going to get crazy for God. I understand the victory he's brought into my life. And so I'll dance. said I'm going to dance and because of Michael decision she became barren so to me you can either dance or you can die you can either dance or be fruitless you can either praise God the enemy He's sitting up there. He's on your shoulder. He's been telling some of you all week, you'll never be anything for God. He's been telling you all week, you have, you, tonight you've gotten to this service. He said, see, you still don't have the Holy Ghost. God doesn't love you, no. Michael, get behind me. Satan, get behind me. God's done some miracles in us this week. And God's getting ready to pour out His Spirit upon those who've been seeking it all week. And God's getting ready to heal people that haven't been healed yet. And God's getting ready to unlock miracles. Why? Because there's some young people that are saying, I'm going to get crazy for God. I'm going to be crazy for Jesus. I don't care what everybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody else does. Oh, clap your hands and shout. Hallelujah. So if you, if you have been seeking the Holy Ghost, we're going to call for you first because I told many of you I said, by the end of this week, you're going to receive the Spirit of God in your life. And we're going to see it happen. If you have been seeking the Holy Ghost but have yet to receive it, you've not received it yet, but you want to, I want you to come right up here, okay? Come right up here. Come right up here in the front. Make room. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Come right up here. There's, there's some that are coming. Woo, this is awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome. This is awesome. Come on, keep coming. That's all right. Real quick, if you did not have the Spirit of God in your life before this week, but God filled you this week, I want you to come and join me on the platform real quick. Come here. Come join me on the stage. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't be embarrassed. Come on. There you go. Come on. Keep coming. The devil is a liar. The devil is the father of all lies. Greater is he. God wants to do a work in your life.
especially this week, we had a few parents come share with us that their children who are not even a part of this camp, at the end of the preaching, their children said, Dad, can we run up to the front? I need, I want to go for prayer. And they ran up here and God filled them with the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that beautiful? If you needed a healing in your body and you know there's something physically changed in you, I want you to come, okay? I want you to come. If you had a battle raging in your mind and God began to lift that and peace began to flow and you felt healing come to your thoughts, I want you to come up here with me right now. Come on. That's beautiful. That's awesome. Not just during my preaching, but any time during the week. To the come. Ah, it's about to get crazy in here. God's been good to us. God's been so good to us. Now listen, those of you who came down to the front wanting to receive the Holy Ghost, can y'all hear me? All of y'all hear me? Okay, can you just spread out a little bit on this this front, in front of the stage here? Just spread out a little bit for me. Just there you go. Just spread, come on down. That's beautiful. Thank you so very much for coming. So very much. And if you, you've not received it, but maybe you were too embarrassed to come, but when we start praying, you want to come? Come on. Okay. Those of you who came wanting to receive the Holy Ghost, here in just a few minutes, actually here in just about 30 seconds, I want you to raise your hands and I want you to begin to, listen, I want you to begin to, hang on y'all, I want you to begin to thank God. I want you to first of all repent and say, God, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, okay? That's the first step. Y'all listening to me? After you do that, I want you to begin to thank God for His forgiveness because He's forgiven you. And as soon as you begin to praise and worship God, hear me, as soon as you begin to worship and praise and exalt God and thank Him for His forgiveness, as soon as you begin to worship Him and praise Him, the Spirit of God is going to begin to flow up in you. And there's going to begin to be a language that comes up in your mouth. Your tongue's going to begin to do something you can't control. Don't try to control it. Let it go. That's the Spirit of God. That's the tongue of heaven. Are you ready? Now, all of you on the platform, just stretch your hands towards them. God's already done the miraculous in you. In the name of Jesus, ministry, help me. In the name of Jesus, upon the authority of the Word of God, right now, in the only saving name, that name which is above every other name, let your spirit begin to fall right now. Hallelujah. There it is. It's already falling right now. That's the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You can't contain it. You can't control it. Some will say it's crazy. Now I want the rest of you to begin to worship God. I want you to begin to get crazy for Jesus. I want you to begin to praise Him in advance. Hallelujah. That's it, it's happening.
Christ when you go back home. Pray that God would saturate you with the Holy Ghost and fire. When you go back home.
sky.